Generating traffic and sales can be a challenge for online merchants. But selling on the Walmart marketplace puts your products in front of millions of customers who shop on walmart.com. And right now, sellers who join Walmart Marketplace can save up to 50% on referral and fulfillment fees for the first 90 days. So get started today. Head over to marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. That's marketplace.walmart.com slash savings. Welcome to E-Commerce Conversations, a weekly podcast from Practical E-Commerce, hosted by entrepreneur Eric Bandholz. What is going on, Internet? Eric Van is back again with another e-commerce conversations. I hope all is going well on the other side of the Internet. On the other side of the Internet from me, Aaron. What's up, man? Eric, nothing. <laughs> <laughs> What's happening? Long time no podcast. It's been uh, a number of years since we've uh, last had you on the show. Yeah, man. Yeah, it's it was uh, it's been a, it's been a minute, but uh, you know a lot of a lot of crazy things. I think it was maybe before the world exploded. I mean, it was a long yeah, time. Was ago. it really that long ago? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It was it was a long oh, time ago. Crap, man. I know. Well, for the people who didn't catch the last episode, who the hell are you? Uh, that's a great question. Something I'm still trying to figure out. Um, you know, I'm I'm an entrepreneur at my at my core and at my soul. Um, it just so happened that uh, my first business didn't really work out. My second business didn't work out. I started uh, actually then recording uh, YouTube videos back in 2008, talking about men's style and grooming and uh, dating relationship and pretty much all lifestyle consuming stuff. And uh, I started posting YouTube videos and um, it was under the the uh, handle Alpha M and that um, kind of took off. It wasn't that I was that great at it. It's just that I was early and uh, I kept doing it. It was it was something that I just loved to do, and I am doing it to this day. Over the years, it's allowed me to to start a few different businesses and and different verticals. I've I've uh, over my illustrious entre- entrepreneurial career, I've had twenty different businesses. Um, most of them didn't work out. Some of them worked out a little. Um, some of them have done fairly well. But but yeah, I'm an entrepreneur. That's what I do, man. Aaron and I had a business together, Area 627, which was one of those that did not work out too well. Actually, I don't think I counted that. That's oh. 21. Yeah, yeah. That that one was so bad. I, I think I tried to forget that as fast as possible. I think I forgot that as fast as we lost that money. Oh, uh, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's an ongoing uh, source of pain for me because it's just like IRS stuff and cleaning up and just like waiting for all that to be done. So. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, you can't win them all, right? Can't win. But them you got to try. Hey, and and that's kind of my thing. I'm going to I'm going to try. I'm going to try. I'm not necessarily the the best when it comes to research or really doing my due diligence and thinking things through. I think if I did that, I'd probably not do half the stuff that I've tried. But uh but yeah, action is a big thing for me and I'll take it and and try it and if it doesn't work, you know, for me, you know, failure was one of the best things that ever happened to me. And when I had my fitness center, um it was an epic failure. That was like my only dream from the age of 12 years old. I wanted to own a fitness center. Long story short, we did it. And at the time I ended up shutting it down, I had half a million dollars in debt. It was just absolutely brutal. Right. And, um, and it just didn't work out. And I was, you know, at the time I was driving a beer car at a country club just to basically put gas in my car and give my then girlfriend, now wife, a few bucks for, you know, food and things of that nature. And, uh, you know, that was, I think the scariest time of my life. And it wasn't necessarily because my business or my idea wasn't working. It's that I didn't know what what plan B was. I didn't have another North Star. You know, I'm the type of guy that I'm going to go 100 percent towards something. And until like basically I'm I'm the dumb guy that keeps like ramming his head against the wall until I get knocked out or, or you know, <laughs> I don't have any more organs to sell. That's kind of my key to, OK, it's probably time to stop. But but yeah, man. Um, yeah, shut that business down. But that was one of the best things looking back in retrospect that happened was because when you fail at the magnitude that I did and when your dreams collapse, it makes trying other things a lot easier and less scary, right? It's like, okay, what's the worst thing that can happen? I'm driving a beer cart. I'm broke. I'm bankrupt. You know, okay. Been there, got the t-shirt. I'm still alive and still awesome. So whatever. Yeah. You're not the uh, first guest on my show who's uh, gone through bankruptcy. And I, I feel like You know, let's talk about that because I think it's been a challenging time for a lot of entrepreneurs who are probably maybe on the verge of bankruptcy. What what does that look like? How do you emotionally get through it? And how do you make sure that 
you know, you don't blow your brains out for. Yeah. I mean, that's, <laughs> that's a, yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you know, bankruptcy for me, you're so stressed, you know, here's the thing, money and, and, and stress and anxiety about money and not having enough money to pay your bills. There is honestly nothing that robs you of joy like that. I mean, it was, at least for me, I can speak from my own experience. And so when you're stressed out to that degree and you're at the point where, you know what, I don't think I'm going to get out of this without, you know, basically trying to wipe the slate clean or doing something drastic. You're, you've been desperate, you've been desperate and you've been emotionally beat down for a long, long time. And so for me, the decision, it was hard, but it was kind of easy in the sense that I got no more options. Like I can't pay these debts. I, I literally, when they do a means test for me, I was making like a hundred dollars, you know, every three weeks. I mean, I was as broke as it got. And so, you know, I didn't have any credit cards. They were all shut down. Like I was out, I was done. I was taking money off of my credit cards to pay my staff at the time. And it wasn't that I was overspending. It was that in terms of, it wasn't that I was going out and buying like nice watches and stuff. And that's what got me into financial trouble. But I, I guess it really doesn't matter, right? At the end of the day, you're still, you know, you're upset, you're depressed. And so when I actually decided to go through with bankruptcy, it was a huge emotional relief. Um, and then when it actually came through, um, it was amazing. Honestly, it was, it was like, I got a new lease on life, but you know, that point for me, it was okay. If I'm going to have this opportunity to kind of get out from this, this, this thousand pound gorilla, I'm never going to make this mistake again. And so it has shaped me um, in terms of the way that I think about money now than it, I did before and about debt. And so it's made me a lot more responsible, I feel. And so, but yeah, it's, um, it's, it's one of the hardest things you're ever going to have to go through, honestly. So you, you go through bankruptcy. I've never been through it. When you get on the other end, I hear like, can you still get credit cards? Like, how do you buy things? Is everything just cash from here on out? No, immediately, immediately. And that was the craziest thing. As soon as I filed bankruptcy, as soon as I got my discharge in the paper, the same day I got a Capital One credit card offer because they know, okay, you can't file bankruptcy for another seven years. And they're going to rip your eyes out with the interest rate too. And so, you know, you do it though, because you're going to start building up your credit. And so you literally start building that credit back almost instantly. And so I think my opening, my credit card, when I got out of bankruptcy, it was like a $300 limit. Okay. Yeah. All right. I'll take okay. that. And, and you just start the process of growing and growing and growing and building it back pay something, you know, buy something paid off, buy something paid off. And you'd be amazed at how fast your credit score actually does come back. Uh, how, where, where's your credit credit score at now? Do you know? Do you now? Know? Yeah. It's like eight eleven. Okay. So even with the bankruptcy on your history, how many years ago was that bankruptcy? Oh, uh, this was back in 2006. Okay. So, so it's, it's been, been forever. Years, yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But I mean, it, it came back to the point where I was able to buy a $35,000 car within about a year after um, and a hundred percent finance. It was about a year after I, I filed bankruptcy that I was able to, and that was one of the things that was like my first big, I bought an infinity G 35, right? And this was in, I think 2007. So I filed bankruptcy in 2006, 2007. I needed a new car because I was starting an image consulting business and I didn't want to drive people around in my RAV4 that smelled like my ass that was 12 years old. And so, <laughs> so, so I went out and I went to the Infinity dealership and the car was $35,000. And, um, and they said, well, with your bankruptcy, with your history, um, it might, we might need to get your wife on as a co-signer. And I go, nope, if you can't do it, then I'm not doing it because it was like kind of one of those things where I've already drug her through this enough. I want to do something and this is for me. And so if I can't do it now, I'll come back. But no, they figure out a way. People, people want to give you money. They mm -hmm. want to lend you money. They want to sell you stuff. Um, but yeah, it wasn't that long until I was able to basically finance something again. Are you, you know, at this point, um, 20 years past bankruptcy, you're not afraid of debt and getting loans, right? I mean, clearly if, if you went and you got your car financed, um, kind of walk me through, is that still an option for you or have you moved to this point where you only want to pay cash for things? So it depends on what it is. Um, but yeah, I, I have gotten to the point where, um, I really prefer to pay cash just because a interest rates are high and I hate seeing the interest payment that I'm paying. Um, but you know, most people can't, 
pay cash. Like my, my office, I bought my office. That was another big purchase for me, um, you know, years ago. And I didn't have, you know, $330,000 laying around. Um, one of the tricky things though, was going to the bank and trying to get a loan, a commercial loan, because it wasn't a first mortgage or you weren't buying a house. And so that was, and that was a bit more challenging. And I had to go through a bunch of different banks. I got rejected six times by six different banks until I found a small, basically it was a referral of somebody that I knew that was in Rotary with a banker. And, um, you know, he got to know me. This was also early days. YouTube wasn't as much of a thing. People didn't really understand how people made money on the internet back then. And so, but he, he gave me a loan, you know, he gave me a loan at a very high interest rate. And the, the interesting thing with commercial properties is that they basically expire every five years. And so every five years, you've got to refinance it. And so I was I was determined to, to pay it off as fast as possible. Um, but no, I'm not I'm not opposed to getting a loan. If you need it, you need it. I mean, if 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 the loan is going to help you, especially like in a business capacity, um, you know, you've basically got two different ways to raise money. You know, when it comes to when it comes to business, you can get debt or you can give equity away. And so, um, you know, depending on, you know, how much money you need, how much, you know, how much help you need, whether or not somebody's bringing, you know, um, you know, intellectual properties or, you know, more than just money to the table. I mean, there's definitely a time and a place for for loans and uh, and debt. Well, let's talk about that. So you've got 20 businesses, 21 businesses that you've kind of done over the years. How do you typically and put the capital into the business. Are they all starting at zero? Are you buying businesses? Are you, you know, just joining businesses? Walk me through like what your preference is for starting a new business. Yeah. So for me, you know, I've, I've done a bunch of different things. I've done, you know, my, my, my largest grossing business is a skincare company called Tee Shanley. That was a partnership. Um, it was me, two other guys. Uh, one of the founders was putting up, I, I believe it was $170,000 of his money. Um, I was bringing in my, my, my audience and my ability to do and generate marketing material through my YouTube channel. And then we had another founder that was also bringing equity to the table, or he was bringing his skill set in terms of he was going to be working in the business. He was also going to be the uh, technological sort of arm of the business. Um, and so that was that scenario. And then, you know, I also started a business called Pete and Pedro. I started that through white labeling or private labeling where um, I started that whole business for $3,000. I basically, you know, was like, hey, I want to start a hair product company. I don't really know that much about hair products. What can I do? I went to a friend of mine who was a stylist and he was like, hey, you could call these people I know. And uh, and that was and that was that process. And so for that business, I like I said, I started it for three thousand dollars. Other businesses that I've started, I started a, a sunglass company uh, called Enemy that's no longer around, and I funded that myself. I put all the money in for that. I was the only owner of that. Uh, I'd since shut it down because I didn't figure out the conversion mechanism in order to convert, and I also built a product that was too expensive for um, what I was charging. I didn't have any ma margin when it came to marketing, um, and so so it really depends. Um, I like putting up the money myself whenever possible, but I also don't take huge wild risks at this point. I don't need typically to spend, if I, you know, I don't need a hundred thousand dollars to start a business, right? A lot of these businesses, you know, you can start and you can validate for much less depending on kind of what you're doing and where you're going and how you're actually forming it. You know, it's, it's kind of interesting. You know, I know a little bit more about your businesses than, than probably most people, but, um, you know, the, the interesting thing with enemy is like, you had no founders with that. You had someone who you were close with was helping work on that with Pete and Pedro it was the same thing. You had no partners with that. T Shanley, you had have a couple of partners with that. Um, Ollie, I think like you, didn't you buy that or you had a partner with that? You came in. We had a few partners with that. Yep. But once again, it was, it was, it was, it was super. I mean, that was also another private label scenario where a dude that we met, who had teeth whitening strips that were pretty awesome. He was like, Hey, I need help. And, you know, and that's, and that's one of the big things. Um, you know, 
you've got to know what you're good at. You know, you got to know what value you're bringing to the table. And if there's somebody else that can bring more value, whether or not it's it's money or whether or not it's experience or going to be the 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 face of your business, like there are different ways to skin that cat. And a lot of times it just takes you kind of being creative and, and doing what feels good, but you just got to be careful. One of the big mistakes I've made over my career um, is giving away equity to people that I should have just paid, right? In terms of, you know, oh, I need tech help. Okay. I want to protect my money. And so I'm just going to give away 15% of my business. Oh, I need somebody to, you know, help me strategize with this. Oh, let me just give you 15% of my business and, and I'll save my money. Well, that, that ended up costing me a lot more than it would had have I just, you know, paid, paid it out. Right. And not, you know, tried to, tried to pinch pennies every, at every turn. Yeah. I think, you know, as an entrepreneur, this bug that we have for like independence and creating our own wealth, we assume that everyone else kind of has that same drive of like independence and, and the same concept and um, concept of what equity is and what it means. But I think a lot of people are, for lack of better terms, employees, like they're, they're designed to exchange their services for money and they don't have that kind of long-term vision of what being an owner means and kind of like that handicap uh, or that handcuffing to a business. Uh, where you're never on uh, that same level. I do think you've developed a, a really, or you do have a very special skill of maintaining relationships. Like a lot of your business partnerships have gone on. Jesus, it's got to be a, almost a decade now with like Tish Hanley. Like, how do you, yeah, how do you handle that? How do you handle the in, inevitable conflict that comes up and make sure that you guys work through those issues rather than fight each other and you know implode the business. Yeah, you know, that's one of the things. T. Shanley was an interesting one for me because I had no prior experience with these two gentlemen when I started. It was strictly a business relationship. Um, we also had a single goal of growing it really fast and then selling it for $100 million five years later. Well, that didn't happen. Uh, we're at year seven now and we're still trying to figure out, you know, what, what we're doing and, and uh, putting the focus back on profitability as opposed to just growth at all costs. And so, you know, most of the people that work for me, most of the people that that um, I have, uh, you know, in my in my ecosystem when it comes to whether or not it's employees or business partners, usually it starts because I've got already a friendship or a relationship with them. And so one of the things that I also am and I'm not to toot my own horn, but I think one of the problems uh, when it comes to business partners is that people get greedy or they don't feel like they're valued enough. And they feel like maybe they work harder or they're bringing more to the table than other people. And I think for me, it's always been about, no, I know what I'm really good at, but I also am very ultra aware that I'm not a great leader. I'm also not great at the management. I do not micromanage. I expect people to do their job and, you know, and, and I'm going to take care of you. And that's, that's one of the other things, you know, I've got you know, at Pete and Pedro, I've got employees that have been with me literally like almost from the start and they're never like, they're, they're never going to go anywhere. And the reason is because I'm going to take care of them. And I do. And I, and I step up for them. I, I make sure that they are well compensated and I, you know, I invite everybody into the business to, to sort of, you know, just, I, I don't hide anything. I don't hide numbers. I, I am super upfront with them about everything because it is a team effort, and um, I truly feel like they're a family more than they are employees or or partners. Um, T. Shanley is a little bit of a different scenario. I have had huge arguments and disagreements with one of my co-founders. We both have a very you know stubborn to some degree you know uh, mindset, and uh, we have gotten into some good ones. And um, at the end of the day, we always figure it out. We. I'm the type of person that wants to deal with it because I have a lot of anxiety whenever there's conflict or something's just not like right. I like it, it eats me alive. And so other people are much better at just kind of like, you know, like taking a break and just like stepping up back for a, a day or two or three. That's not me. But what we've been ultimately able to do is, is always come together and always talk through it and realize that we both have ultimately the same goal and that is to build the best company possible and um and respect i think that ultimately is one of the other key ingredients is you know respecting the people that work with with you for you and uh and who you're going to partner with if you don't have respect or you don't trust them um you know what can you do i also have another business that i have uh, some partners with i own a hair salon which um you know i i have you know partner courtney and tony who i 
would trust with my life. And, um, you know, you need that when it comes to making sure that, because I mean, with business, you're trusting them and you're trusting your partners with so much. Right. Um, and so just having that, that trust and that respect and, and really putting other people's good ahead of yours, I think is really what my, my secret has been. Well, one of the things I've seen you get the most excited about is your, your small YouTube channel. Where, yeah. Like, it seems like the energy and the fire and, you know, like YouTube's such a, a challenging beast. And, and I know this as a fellow YouTuber is like, you kind of get pigeonholed in a certain type of content and you can't really branch out of it because those views will be bad. And then that may indicate to the YouTube formulation that, you know, your content's no longer good. So you, you, your channel can, <laughs> we call it in YouTube, the death spiral. Uh, so we're always in fear of that. But you've spun off a new channel. Talk me through what this new channel is about and, and kind of the journey of, of what you've done with that. Yeah. Uh, so so for me, it was, you know, I am, like I said at the beginning, I am an entrepreneur at my core. That's what I do. I love business. I love thinking about business. I love talking about business. I love learning about business. And so one of the problems is on my other, my youth, my main YouTube channel, it was all about my, like men's grooming and style and, and things. It's like, okay, there, there's a time and a place for that. But what I really want to talk about is business and, and just exactly what you said, Eric, it's like, I did a few videos about business and they bombed like the worst views ever. Right. And so I decided, you know what, let me try starting just another channel. I'm starting with zero subscribers, zero expectations, and I'm going to call it the alpha empire. And the whole concept is I'm going to share my, my experience and things that I think you need to know in order to build your, you know, quote unquote empire. And so it's been a year. I've had the channel now for about a year and I didn't monetize it at all for the first year. It was just me talking about things just to see what hit, what people are interested in, what videos would do well, what are people wanting? And what ended up happening was I found like a, a renewed passion, right? And, and, you know, they talk about, you talk about passion all the time. And, um, you know, with, with YouTube, you know, at first when I started posting YouTube videos for the first like seven, eight years, I was super passionate about it, but then it loses a little bit of its shine and it becomes a little bit more of a job than it does something that you're really pumped and excited to do and show up and, and execute. And so with this new channel, there were no expectations. I didn't have brands that I needed to worry about performing in terms of sponsorships. I could just talk about anything that I wanted and it started to grow. Um, you know, it's, it's not the biggest channel. It's got around 70,000 subscribers in a year, which is not horrible, not great. Um, but I love doing it. And what's come out of that is sort of an idea for a, a business community, because I, I realized that there was this missing piece or, or platform out there. There were, really isn't that there's not a lot of help for guys that want to start businesses or entrepreneurship. Um, that's not like some like scammy course of, you know, Hey, this is how you do it. Like an Amazon drop shipping business and, and stuff like that. And so I wanted to basically leverage my experience in the private labeling, white label, because here's the other thing, you know, private labeling and white labeling and, and custom manufacturing are basically like the same thing with like one step changed or maybe two. Right. And so a lot of products, your favorite products start as like a base formulation by one of these, you know, experienced manufacturers that have already created something awesome. And then you're coming in and putting your spin on it, whether or not you're customizing it, putting a new scent or adding an ingredient or doing your label or whatever it may be. The process is pretty the same in terms of start you know, ideation, execution, you know, ordering, marketing, right? Because that's the other thing. It's really, you know, you can have the greatest product in the world, but if you don't know marketing or you don't know how to actually drive views or traffic to your website, then you're going to have the greatest product that nobody's heard of. And so it's been amazing. And I've just really, really, really loved it. Well, I'll kind of like piggyback onto that. And you, you talked about formulation and obviously you and I are both in the, the grooming space, but White labeling, private labeling is not just for grooming products. You know, I've looked into, you know, like hair dryers, obviously hair dryers are another grooming one, but it's not like a, a, a liquid formulation. It's like a, an actual tool. There, the, 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 the amount of products out there are really endless that you can white label. Um, oh, absolutely. And in fact, I remember you did a, a little mini vacuum cleaner. Uh, yeah, you still got the stubble that? buddy. Yeah. Oh yeah. I still sell it. Yeah. <laughs> stubble buddy. It was a, it was a, here, 
<laughs> it was a, it was a, it's a, it's this little like mini vacuum that you use for your keyboard to pick up like crumbs. And I saw like a viral video where somebody used it to pick up beard stubble in their sink. And I'm like, it's brilliant. And so that was another business. It was like, oh, the stubble buddy. And so yeah, white labeled that. And the other thing is like my sunglass company, right? My sunglasses were kind of, they were custom because I, I customized the, the design, but that started as a white label. I reached out to vendors on Alibaba that sold sunglasses. I said, hey, send me a bunch of sunglasses. Let me see. Let me test. Let me experience the quality. And then the truth is, you know, it's not China or cheap China shit unless, you know, it's only cheap China shit if you use cheap China shit, you know, components. But I mean, you can... I, you know, like the sunglasses were like Zeiss lenses and, and, um, you know, Mezzicelli acetate. And I mean, it was a super premium product that started and was born through the white labeling process. The process is the same. It's just how you customize it and work with the vendor in order to make it your own. That really distinguishes, you know, a custom product from something that was white labeled or started that way. Yeah. If if you've never gotten into this, this can seem overwhelming. Like how are newbies into the space going to find their product figure their product out you know find where these manufacturers are like kind of what are some of those good strategies uh join the white label empire baby <laughs> <laughs> i created I'm a whole course tossing softballs here for you eric. exactly uh well eric actually they could they could join the white label empire uh where I have a complete curriculum that walks you through. It's like 37 different lessons that teaches you the whole process. Um, and then you're a part of the community. And and then it's just, the community is absolutely amazing. But in terms of just some low-hanging fruit, right? Um, and that's one of the other things that we talk about in the community and in the curriculum is, you know, drop shipping, right? Drop shipping is also another one of those things that's sexy. You know, drop shipping and and private labeling are also kind of similar in terms of all the processes are basically the same from setting up your business to sourcing products. Where you source them is a little bit different. But the upside to drop shipping is you don't have the inventory or overhead that you are going to need when it comes to white labeling. Now, that's one of the other upsides to white labeling or private labeling, right? Your opening inventory or minimum order quantity is much lower than you're going to find if you did something custom. Give you an example. All right. A custom manufacturing hair product that we make at Pete and Pedro now, minimum order quantity, 5,000 units per, per, per SKU. All right. Private labeling, you could do 36, right? You're going to pay a little bit more, but the truth is that it's going to allow you to test. It's going to allow you to adjust. It's going to allow you to get out there and, and really hone your marketing skills and and get selling. And then along the way, as you grow, then you go a little bit more custom, which is what happened, you know, with Pete and Pedro. But the the startup capital and the inventory requirement is much much different from custom to white labeling. And drop shipping is basically you going sourcing products that you think are cool. And basically getting a cut or the delta of what you're selling it for and what you're able to buy it for. The downside to that is that the products aren't your own and typically they're not branded. You're not building a brand. You're really just selling cool stuff yeah. to your audience. But it does come down to building your audience and the marketing component is very, very similar to whatever business you're starting. At that point, you might as well just be like an affiliate marketer. <laughs> yeah. You know, it's like yeah. less headache, less risk. You know, you're kind of separating yourself from the brand. Uh, yeah. versus wearing this burden of a, a fake retailer uh, for, I mean, not to, to talk shit on any drop shippers. Cause I know there's some unique drop shipping methods where they can, you know, use data in s sophisticated ways that the, the manufacturers can't do. So that's where the value add is. But um, you kind of got to think about those risks as well from a, a consumer perspective. I also wanted to talk Absolutely. about like, I'm a big fan of starting businesses and, and launching products as cheaply as possible. You know, the beard brand start story is like we effectively started with like a $30 subscription to Shopify and a, a promise from a, a manufacturer who was already making a product. Um, we were going to be just more of a traditional retailer and buy his products and resell it at wholesale. Um, but that first order, like we got orders before that first batch came in. So he was effectively shipping them for us and was kind of drop shipping. So you know, like it, in today's day and age, you can start anything for like super cheap. Um, you know, you said 36 products, let's say at worst they're $10 a unit and you sell for $20 a unit, you know, that's $360 that it's going to cost you to build a business. And then plus your time to set up a website like that is nothing. 
Like if you don't have that, you certainly should not be trying to get started in a business. But no, a hundred percent. And and that's the, that's the thing, right? I mean, the internet has changed the game when it comes to entrepreneurship and business. I mean, period. And um, it's almost like taking a test with the with the book open, right? <laughs> if you want to start a business. You know, the information is out there. It's never been more affordable. It's never, you've never had, everybody has like the same access. Everybody's starting basically at the same place and has the same opportunities. It's just some people will take action and most people won't, you know, but it's, it's out there. You know, it's, it's a plug and play, set it and forget, not set it and forget it. You actually, I've never figured that out yet. Mm -hmm. Uh, But, you know, it's one of those things where you just need to find somebody that's done it, copy what they did get their advice or somebody else's advice and, and do it for yourself. It's not that hot. Like, here's the deal. If I can do it, anybody can do it because I'm not tech savvy. I'm also not that smart. And so if I can do it, pretty much anybody can do it. And that is, that is a fact. Uh, Pete and Pedro is incredibly successful. You've got a ton of new products. Like, do you feel like you grow out of the private label, white label, or is that something that's always going to be part of your business strategy with, with product launches? Yeah, no, I think, you know, and that's one of the beautiful things with white labeling, right? So, so we are now effectively a custom manufacturer company, right? But when we launch a new product, right, I've got great vendors. And so that's one of the easy way, like a women's line, I wanted to start a women's line. So it's like, okay, how do I do that? And how do I test it, right? I don't know really that much about women's products, but I do know that I've got some great, you know, manufacturers that I've that I've you know connected with over the years, and I know that they private label, you know, some incredible women's products that are super high quality. So let me just order a small inventory, maybe change the packaging, change a few little things, and let me test it. And so that's one of my strategies. I mean, absolutely, it's you know, let's let's try it with low risk. And try because I don't want to be sitting on 5,000 units of something that I don't know for 100% fact I'm going to be able to sell in 12 months, right? Because, you know, any inventory that's sitting on the shelves not moving obviously is dead dollar bills. You can't do anything with it. And, and if it expires and goes bad, it's literally like you just lit money on fire. And so for me, I'm ultra aware of that. So I would rather start, you know, small with a private label opportunity or a white label opportunity and, and go from there. And then once I grow it to the capacity that I can customize it, then of course, you know, that's always something that I'm looking to do. Well, not only that, like you're going to have the feedback from your customers for what kind of changes do they want? So you're able to like launch with this product and they're like, Oh, I wish, you know, the fragrance was a little stronger or I wish, you know, it was a little bit tackier or, you know, whatever it is, then you're like, okay, this is the product I have. Let's just tweak it this much and then we'll have version two or whatever. So it's like, hundred percent, you know, kind of like the best of both worlds where not only are you able to test inexpensively, but you're also able to iterate and change and adjust to your customer's needs uh, far quicker. Absolutely. You've done this before, Eric, it sounds like. Well, I've never done, I've never done. Well, I guess I I have uh, our scissors we sell. And uh, our uh, brushes and combs are private labels. So, yeah, I guess I do a little bit of it. Uh, see? Yeah. See that who sticks his nose up at white and private label? Well, I don't think <laughs> I, I, do, I, do like to make, I do like to make new products, <laughs> but it's, uh, I, I'm not against it as well. So, like, you have to also kind of understand, like, what is my core? Like, and if you want to bring in accessory items, that's another great way to utilize white label, in my opinion. So, it's like you have these core items. And then you need something else that people aren't really coming to Beard Brand for, you know, like T-shirts or or whatever it is. So I'm just going to work off of this T-shirt blank that I have and, you know, utilize that rather than create my whole own custom made T-shirt like that. I think that's kind of like the. Yeah. And here another example of of, and that's one of the things. So so like I created a, a soap, right? And it was a it was a custom formulation, but the way that it worked, it kind of was very similar to the white label process. For where I went to my my contract manufacturer, I said, "Hey, I want to I want to do a soap. What other soaps do you make?" And they sent me basically twelve soaps. Right? I did the same thing with deodorants. I said, "Send me your best natural deodorants. Let me test it. Let me see what's going on." 
And so they send it and then you basically give them feedback. It's like, okay, I like the exfoliating from this one. I like the smell of this one. Like I want to use this, you know, eucalyptus spearmint scent that we've got for our deodorant. Like you can customize it, but still you can use other products that are already on the market as inspiration or that your, your vendor manufacturer or contract manufacturer is actually making, because you'd be surprised a lot of the manufacturers that you're going to find, whether or not it's white labeling or uh, private labeling or custom, you know, contract manufacturers, a lot of them, you know, work with some of your most pop, you know, very, very famous popular brands. And so, you know, you can tweak and they can, you know, they're very familiar with the, with the various different options, depending on what you're selling. Where can people follow you, reach out to you, join your curriculum? Yeah, baby. Um, thanks for asking. Um, YouTube channel, if you want business, because I assume that this is a business po- uh, platform, it's uh, Alpha M Pyre. That's M P I R E. And uh, if you want to check out the uh, the uh, free tutorial, it's a twenty minute video where I actually walk you through the whole process of starting a white label business, and I use my sunglass company as an example, uh, you can go to uh, the White Label Empire. That's M P I R E dot com and check it out. And if you're interested in joining us and doing something amazing, you can sign up right there. Aaron, are you on X by chance? X? Yeah. Twitter? Like ecstasy? No. no, no. no I'm not. <laughs> I've got a Twitter account uh, or X. I, I've, uh, I've, uh, I, I've, can I be honest? I've yeah. never sent a tweet in my life. I think uh, my assistant has it. Yeah. I know uh, you're a big oh, X I love, guy. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I love it. So You're either like, yeah, but that it fits with you. It fits with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, man. I appreciate you coming on. I hope you guys listening enjoyed it as much as I did. Aaron is a good friend of mine. I trust him intently with the advice that he gives. Uh, we talk regularly, and he's helped me personally. So I encourage you guys to check out what Aaron is doing. He is a wonderful individual with a lot of information. He gives way too much away for free. As always, this has been another e-commerce conversations. Cheers. Keep on growing.